Look with me in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Let's talk about the word creation and new creation. The Bible says in John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jumping down to verse 9, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. Verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. We'll finish with verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is at the father's side has made him known to us. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to minister to us this morning. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, I, I pray that you'd come and open our minds and give us the ability to receive your word. Open our hearts. Open our spiritual eyes and spiritual ears, Lord. I pray we would encounter you today through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. For the last few weeks, we've been talking about the transformed Christian mind. Our starting place was Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul says there, don't be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word there is actually metamorphosis. But with these words, Paul tells us that there is an antithesis between secular society and Christianity. There is an antithesis between secular priorities and Christian priorities. Jesus talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount. He said that unbelievers chase after food and drink and financial security and pleasure. But believers pursue God's kingdom and his righteousness. And then God adds to them everything they need. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? There's an antithesis between secular morals and values and Christian morals and, val and values. There's an antithesis between secular thinking and Christian thinking. So what is a Christian worldview? As followers of Jesus, how do we see our world? What is our place in this world? What is our mission according to Jesus? How much of what they do should we do? I would suggest to you we should do less of what they do than we do. How do we see human history and human government? What's our responsibility? Those are especially pertinent questions right now, and there are good answers in the Bible. We've started with what's familiar to many of us so that we can move together towards what is perhaps less familiar. We've talked about the Bible and why we believe it's the Word of God and why it's the final authority for us. We talked about a well-rounded picture of God who is both holy and loving in equal measures. God's holiness demands that he cannot dismiss sin. He cannot leave it unaddressed. He cannot leave it unpunished. Sin is serious to God. It's an affront to him. But God's love determined that he would bear the penalty for sin himself so that we could receive the grace of his forgiveness. The holiness and love of God met together in the person of Jesus on his cross. Today I want to talk about a Christian view of creation and what it means very personally for us. So let's talk for a few minutes about the word creation and new creations. First of all, why is Jesus called the word of God? 
In John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is introduced by a title that no other New Testament writer uses. Jesus is called the Logos, the Word of God. John uses this title for Jesus again in his later letters. And in the book of Revelation, John writes that when Jesus comes again, he will be called by the title, the Word of God. At the end of his life, John pastored the church in the Greek city of Ephesus that was made up of both Jewish and Gentile believers in Jesus. And interestingly, that term logos, the Word, was meaningful for both Jews and Greeks. So what does it mean that Jesus is called the Word? Well, for one thing, the Word means that Jesus is God's ultimate message to us. Jesus is God's final decisive Word. Hebrews says, in the past, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets at many times in various ways. But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. For the Jewish people, the Logos, the Word, meant the will of God that was revealed in the scriptures, in the Old Testament scriptures. And Jesus was the word come to life. Jesus was scripture come to life. He was the living embodiment of all the righteousness described in the law and in the rest of the Old Testament. Jesus talked about that. He said, don't think that I have come to abolish the law. He said, I have come to fulfill the law. He was the personification of God's law. If you could take all the prescriptions and all the highest ideals of the Old Testament and use them to make one model man, that man is Jesus. Jesus was perfectly wise and perfectly good, perfectly in tune with God and perfectly submitted to God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible came to life and lived among us. The will of God became animated and was put on display for us. Rather than just reading about it in the pages of Scripture, we could see it demonstrated in Jesus. Why is Jesus called the Word? Well, the word means that he's God's ultimate message to us. And the word means that Jesus is God's power at work in the world, beginning with creation. For the Jewish people, the word of God released the power of God into the world. You know, we have a little saying. We say talk is cheap, right? But, you know, in the Bible, words are powerful. Words are alive. They cause things to happen. They accomplish things. To speak blessing over someone is to actually release the favor of God on them. At the end of every Sunday service, I bless you in the name of Jesus. And I am releasing the favor of God on you when I do that. To curse someone is actually to release hindering forces upon him. The power of life and death are in the tongue. And if the words of men are that powerful, how much more powerful is the word of God? The word of God was the active agent in creation. The psalmist wrote by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and the host of them by the breath of his mouth. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters above and the waters below. And it was so. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered together in one place and let dry ground appear and let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees that bear fruit with seed in it according to the various kinds. And it was so. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from night. Let them serve as signs to mark the seasons and days and years and let them be lights to the world. And it was so. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. And it was so. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. 
livestock and creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. God said it, and it was so. By the way, just so you know that there is absolutely zero evidence for the theory of evolution in the fossil record. You know, they have never found a missing link. They keep putting forward missing links, and everyone they've put forward so far, they've discovered was a hoax, a fake. The, in fact, what the, the fossil record does show is something called the Cambrian explosion, which is all kinds of animal life appeared all at once at the same time. Complex animals, simple animals, vertebrates, invertebrates, they all appear in the fossil record at the same time. And there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever uh, of, of a development from more simple atom, uh, animals to more complex animals. The reason why is because God said and it was so. God's presence always accompanies his word and his word always accomplishes its purposes. God said, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and don't return without watering the earth and making it flower and bud and flourish so that it yields seed to the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty but it will accomplish what I desire and it will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Amen. Beloved, somebody received the word of the Lord this morning. If God said it, it shall be so. Whatever God has said about you in his word, it shall be so. Whatever God has said to you through the gift of prophecy, it shall be so. He is the God that calls those things that are not as if they were. What God said you will become, you shall become. What God said you will have, you shall have. What God said you will do, you will do. If God said you're blessed, you're going to be blessed. If God said you're protected, you're going to be protected. If God said you're fruitful, you're going to be fruitful. Be of good cheer. I believe God and it shall be just as he told me. The word of God is the power of God that accomplishes his purposes. So when Jesus is introduced in John 1.1 1, 1 as the word, it identifies him as the agent who manifests God's power in the world. And specifically, he manifests God's power to those who trust in him. So we've talked about the word. Now let's talk about the word and creation. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Through him all things were made. And without him nothing was made that has been made. Looking at John's words, I find they reveal a few things about Jesus' role in creation. First of all, Jesus is the creator of time and space. John 1.1 takes us back to Genesis 1.1 in the beginning. And it tells us that before time and space existed, Jesus already was. In the beginning was the word. That verb in Greek is in a continuous past tense. It means Jesus always was, wasing. John 1.1 1, 1 literally means before the beginning began, Jesus already was. Before time began, Jesus already was. Before the universe was made, Jesus already was. Jesus existed before time and space, and he's the agent through whom time and space were created. Hebrews 1, 2 says, through him, through Jesus, God made the universe. That word universe is the Greek word aeon, which means ages. Through Jesus, God made the ages. He made time. He existed before time, and he will yet exist when time is no more. That's why he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus is the creator of time and space. And second, Jesus is the creator of everything that has been made. Through him, all things were made. And without him, not one thing was made 
that has been made. Jesus created everything that exists out of nothing. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. Jesus created the superstar clusters. He created the galaxies. He created the solar systems. He created all the stars and all the planets and all the moons and all the meteors and all the matter in space. He created our solar system and our planet, and he created everything on our planet in particular. He created every plant specifically as it is. He created every fish specifically as it is, every bird, every animal specifically as it is. This is an important point. The Bible doesn't say that God is the impetus of life only. It doesn't say that he's the source of life only. It doesn't say that God set everything in motion and then it all unfolded on its own. God is more than just merely the source of the Big Bang. The Bible says that he was immediately involved in the creation of every single thing. Jesus created the Rafflesia Arnaldi. That's a plant that has no root It has no stem, it has no leaf, it's just an enormous flower, and it smells really bad. (laughs) Jesus created the Boab tree. It can hold 26,000 gallons of water. That's as much as the average backyard swimming pool. Jesus created the ocean sunfish. That is not a photoshopped picture. That is the largest bony fish in the ocean. It can grow up to 2,200 pounds. I wouldn't want to meet it. (laughs) Jesus created the helmeted hornbill. They hang out in Malaysia. I'm glad I never ran into one while I was over there teaching. (laughs) Jesus created the South American alpaca. I know it looks cute, but don't make it mad because it spits green goo. That Jesus created everything means that evolution is not only wrong in its explanation of the origins of life, but evolution is wrong entirely. There is no reconciling of evolution and creation. Life hasn't evolved from one form to another. Jesus has made every single thing each after its own kind. The Bible says to each kind of seed, God gives its own body just as he's determined And not all flesh is the same, Paul said. Men have one kind of flesh, and animals have another, and birds have another, and fish another. Jesus is the creator of time and space. He's the creator specifically of everything that has been made. And third, Jesus bestows physical life and consciousness on every person. John says the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Do you know that life belongs exclusively to God? Life is his alone. In him was life, John says. In John chapter 5, Jesus says the Father has life in himself. Life is uh, exclusively the domain of God, but life is the gift that he bestows on all mankind through Jesus. That's why Peter calls him in Acts 3.15, the author of life. God created man in his own image out of the dust of the earth. He breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and man became a living soul. And God continues to bestow the gifts of, that might be Jesus calling, you better get that. God continues to bestow the gifts of life and consciousness on every person born into the world. Beloved, listen to me for a second. Jesus is involved with the development of each person in the womb. David said, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I want you to listen to this because if ever there was a time in the world where we need a theology of personhood, it's now. Beloved, I want you to know that as followers of Jesus, 
The, the issues of personhood are not political issues. They're not racial issues. They're not civil rights issues. They're not social issues. These are theological issues. You have breath in your lungs today because Jesus bestowed life on you specifically. You can see and hear and smell and taste and touch and move because Jesus made you alive. You are self-aware because Jesus made you a living soul. You can think and reason and feel and create because Jesus bestowed on you the light of human consciousness. You are exactly who you are because Jesus made you you. You were born when you were because Jesus ordained it. You were born where you were because Jesus ordained it. Listen to me. You were born the sex you are because Jesus ordained it. Paul stood on Mars hills and he, and he proclaimed to the Athenians, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He himself gives men life and breath and everything else. He determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. I'm so glad that the Lord determined for me to be alive right now and to live in the United States of America. I'm very thankful for that. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him for he is not far from any one of us for in him we live and move and have our being. Beloved, human life is precious. Human life is sacred. Because God himself bestows life on every person individually. And God sustains every person individually. Listen, in, in, in these times we need a biblical basis for personhood, for understanding the dignity and the value and the identity of every person. Jesus said Satan is a thief. He comes to steal and kill and destroy. He is the original identity thief. And his mission is to strip us of every ounce of God-given identity right down to our femininity and our masculinity, what is most basic to us. But Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And Jesus left to those who believe in him an inheritance of his own peace. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, my peace, I leave you. That word peace is the word shalom. You know what shalom means? It means wholeness. Nothing is missing. And nothing is broken. To those who love him, Jesus leaves an inheritance of his shalom, his wholeness. That means perfect masculinity for men and perfect femininity for women. The devil's mission is to make people confused. But Jesus' work is to make us complete and confident. Jesus is the creator of time and space. He's the creator specifically of everything that has been made. He bestows physical life and consciousness on every person specifically. And Jesus sustains the universe and all physical matter and every human life. John is telling us that he is the source of life for everything that presently exists. Jesus is the one who is holding it all together. Paul wrote to the Colossians, he's the image of the unseen God. The firstborn over all creation. Firstborn doesn't mean that Jesus himself is a created being. It means he's the leader. He's the head of creation. For by him all things were created in heaven on earth, whether visible or invisible. He is before all things. And listen, in him all things hold together. Do you know that scientists don't know what holds the universe together? They don't know what holds matter together. They don't know why atoms hold together. They don't know what keeps atoms stable. 
They've identified in theory forces that they call strong and weak forces that prevent everything from either imploding or exploding, but they can't explain those forces. But we know who the force is. The force is Jesus. Peter tells us that one day Jesus is going to let go. He says the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will melt with fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. That word for elements is the Greek word stoikin. It's the basic building blocks of the universe, atoms. The word melt is the Greek word luo, which means to let loose. So Peter says, on the day of the Lord, the atoms will let loose. Jesus is going to let go. But I'm so glad that today he's holding everything together. The writer of Hebrews says he sustains all things by his powerful word. Jesus is sustaining also the physical life of every person on earth. Do you know that scientists don't know what makes the human heart beat? They can do so many things with the heart. They can unblock arteries. They can replace valves. They can take the heart out of the chest of one man and put it in another man and make it go. They can regulate the beating of the heart, but they don't know what makes it beat. There's a little bundle of nerves on the heart called the bundle of hiss. It's named after the Swiss researcher that discovered it. And it's what makes the heart beat. I I think it's kind of funny that what makes the heart beat is called his bundle. They don't know what makes it start when it starts and what makes it stop when it stops. But we do. The psalmist said, God is the strength of my heart and he's my portion forever. Paul said there is but one God, the Father from whom all things come, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Hebrews says Jesus sustains all things by his powerful word. That word sustains is interesting. It means to move something along towards a goal, to move something along towards an end. So Jesus, the word, is moving everything in creation along towards the fulfillment of God's plans and God's purposes. And what Jesus is moving creation toward is reconciliation with the Father. Colossians says all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile all things to himself through the shedding of his blood. You know, more than the story of original creation, the gospel is the story of the recreation of individuals. The word means Jesus was the agent in creation. But even better, the word means that Jesus is the agent of new creation. He bestows spiritual life on all who believe in him. So let's finish with that very quickly. We talked about why Jesus is called the word. We talked about the word and creation. Now, quickly, let's talk about the word and new creation. John says he came to his own. And his own did not receive him, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. Very quickly, three ways that Jesus is involved with the new creation of believers. First of all, Jesus is the agent of spiritual rebirth. Just like Jesus is the active agent in the natural birth of every person, he is the active agent of the spiritual rebirth of everyone who believes on him. When you were in your mother's womb, Jesus bestowed on you physical life and human consciousness. Now when you believe on him, when you receive him, he bestows on you another kind of life, zoe, spiritual life. And that life gives you spiritual consciousness. It allows you to know God. It allows you to communicate with God. It allows you to receive his guidance. And that life is eternal. It keeps right on living. Even when physical life runs out. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. 
three ways that Jesus is involved with the new creation of believers. Second, Jesus is the agent that restores relationship with the Father. The word means that Jesus is the bridge between God and man. When Adam sinned, it caused a breach in his relationship with God and all of humanity with him. But Jesus was sent by the Father to restore that lost relationship through the shedding of his own blood. To as many as received him, to those who believed in his name, to them he gave the power to become God's children reconciled with the Father. Three ways that Jesus is involved with the new creation of believers. Finally this, Jesus is the agent of eternal life that sustains believers. Beloved, listen, just like Jesus is holding all matter together and he's the sustainer of every beating heart on this planet, Jesus also sustains the spiritual life of everyone who believes in him. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. The life flows through me and into you and you'll be fruitful. Jesus is the one who is holding me together. He's the one who is keeping me alive. In him we live and move and have our being. There's one last thing that the word means. The word means that Jesus wrote the book on me. He's the one who fearfully and wonderfully made me while I was in my mother's womb. He's the one who blew the breath of life into my nostrils. He's the one who made me a living soul. He's the one who gave me the ability to see and hear and smell and taste and touch and move. He gave me the ability to think and reason and feel and create. He's the one who made me a man. He's the one who made me uniquely me. He wrote the book on me. That means he knows exactly what I need. That means he knows exactly when something goes wrong with me and he knows just how to fix it. He knows how to recommend what's best for me. He's my maker and this book is the manufacturer's manual for peak performance and longevity. And since he wrote the book on me, I can entrust myself to him without reservation. I can trust his instructions, even when they don't seem to make sense to me, even when they seem counterintuitive or perhaps not that important. I can trust, since he wrote the book on me, I can trust his instructions. I can entrust myself into his hands. I can entrust myself to his plans. I can entrust myself to his leadership. Our twins just turned 15 years old a short while ago. My wife and I had a difficult time getting pregnant. We went through some miscarriages. And I'll never forget when we found out that Denise was expecting and we went for the first ultrasound, then we saw two beating hearts on that ultrasound. They looked like, remember Pac-Man from the 80s? They looked like, they looked like two little Pac-Mans on the screen. It was love at first sight. We were smitten from the moment we saw those little beating hearts. And the kids were born premature. They were about four pounds each. They didn't even make baby clothes small enough for them. But a couple months after they were born, we noticed something funny going on with Ben's abdomen. So we took him to the doctor, and the doctor referred us to a pediat pediatric surgeon in New York and we discovered that Ben had a congenital hernia and he needed surgery. We understood that surgery was necessary. We understood that he had to have it so he wouldn't be in pain. We, we understood that he, he needed it so that there wouldn't be future complications, but we were afraid. And as we talked in the office, the surgeon said to us, this is the classic example of a congenital inguinal hernia. It looks exactly like the pictures in the textbook I wrote about this surgery. And we discovered that the surgeon that we were seeing was the one who wrote the book on this particular surgery that was used by all the pediatric surgeons, by all the students studying for pediatric surgery across the country. And when we found out that 
we were in the hands of the one who wrote the book on the subject, it made it so much easier for us to entrust our little son into his hands. Who is Jesus? He is the word of God. He is your creator. He is the one who wrote the book on you and he is your recreator. He's the one who can write your name in the Lamb's book of life. You can entrust yourself completely to his hands.